I do have a bone to pick with you, Jennifer Beatty. All right. You've got your hair in a top knot again, but you've been wearing it in all yeah. your promos in a in a low Fran Kirby style pony. Well, I knew Fran was coming on the podcast, so in order to sort of win her over, I was like, let's Fran it up. So I went more Fran <laughs> Kirby style, and now she's here. And yet, you know what? My backup is at 6.45 in the morning for me. I've rolled out of bed, I'll be completely honest. But I just knew she was coming on the podcast, so I was just like, right, okay, how can I make Fran feel comfortable? Just a style icon. <laughs> Can't help it. Oh. Yeah, there you go. You are. You are. Absolutely not. Well, the first time I think I ever spoke to you, Fran, you had the short one, and then you had to go through everything we had to do as grow as we do growing up when you're trying to grow it out and then you can't quite which is footballers must be hell of annoying to get the fringe it out was the a way. nightmare there's no way fran wants to speak about here <laughs> yeah. right you've absolutely killed you her. can see the look on her face there straight away <laughs> she's like i didn't come on for do you this know what? I, look- it was just part of who i was you know it was very distinctive it was you know and the hair growing process mm. was brutal i had about 15 16 little you don't remember the little plastic hair ties yeah little the, the ones we used to use and Siobhan Chamberlain <laughs> literally was like doing like about 55 different ponytails to try and get it all so it stayed out of my face it was yeah it was a tough when when I managed to get it all in one it was like celebration see I think you're wrong Jen yeah I know you're wrong Jen this is very much Fran wanting yeah. to talk about it I take I take back what I said because that was an un, <laughs> that was an unbelievable answer yeah I take it back I take it back <laughs> Listening to three players in a podcast from Sky Sports. Three players, three topics, and hopefully a podcast out the other end of it. In the company of Jen, no longer top not BT. Rachel always on, no, always on top. I can't say that. <laughs> no. Rachel always top yes. Yankee. And super, super, super <laughs> Fran Kirby. Let's leave it there, shall we? Right, coming up this week could be some kind of superstar. People all over the world. And who let the dogs out? Who, who, who? Right, topic number one, superstars who are unplayable. You were, you all are, stroke, superstars. That's a given, right? And because Fran is on the podcast, I think you were once described, Fran, by a member of our team as unplayable. So in honour of you, when do you know you're a, a superstar? What's it like having someone totally unplayable in your team and you're just like, Right, give it to Fran Kirby and she'll score. Is that pretty much how it goes, Fran? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're blowing smoke here. Um, I mean, obviously, I think when you're kind of in that rhythm of playing and playing consistent, consistently, you just kind of have the flow of just feeling like you can do whatever you want. And I think when I'm in that flow of consistently playing, consistently game time and building confidence, and you kind of just feel like you are gliding. And it doesn't really matter what anyone else is doing. You see things quicker than other people. Your passes are more crisp. Your shots have more venom in them. It's just something I read a quote yesterday from Carol Hansen and she was in an interview. She's probably having her best season for Barcelona this year. And she was just saying just to play all the time and play freely and play with that confidence. You see the best out of people. So I think that's kind of how it feels. And obviously going on to, you know, the new superstars that are coming through it, probably how, how it feels for them as well. Still a superstar. Yeah, I was reading that you, um, Fran, before you go into a match, you like you think, okay, what can I do today that's going to make me remember it? What am I going to remember from today? So it's, it is it's sort of a conscious decision from you to try something, to go and do something, to make people get on their feet. Yeah, I mean, especially when you're confident, you maybe try things that you wouldn't if you, say, weren't playing as often. I think you try and do different things and maybe you're forgiven a little bit more for trying them things, especially when you know you've got the confidence, the flow and things are coming off you. And for me, I've always been a player that will always have a what if the pass comes off. And, you know, I'm not scared to try and play them passes. Maybe it comes off, maybe it doesn't, but at least you've tried it. And obviously when you have that confidence to try it or try a little flick around the corner or, you know, it it just kind of flows and comes naturally to you. So I wouldn't say that I sit there and I go, I'm going to do something today that everyone's going to post about and love it. And I think it's just more, to go out with a freedom and to think, right, okay, for example, when I'm in the flow and know what my number nine is going to do playing with Sam Kerr, like, can I thread a pass through that maybe others would turn or turn down if they weren't as confident? So it's just building that confidence up to, to try them passes. I love that. I love the mentality. It's just the, the, the mindset of a creative player has got to be allowed the freedom to yeah. 
to have these crazy ideas and take risks and be brave. And, you know, that's when you get your moments of magic. And, and that's what, I don't know, as a fan, you want to see. You want to see someone do something that you possibly can't do and just, uh, you know, to get you off your feet. So, yeah, it's, it's really nice to hear that that's, that's kind of how you feel and how you felt going into matches and, you know, what you what you prepare and what you try and do. Because uh, I think young kids coming through, sometimes they're kind of stopped and we, we, we try and box people by coaching them and telling them do this and do that. But actually the freedom of being expressive is, is so powerful. Compared to a centre-back when all we think about is safe, safe. Stop, Play stop safe. them, safe. Stop, just safe. Pass it, just pass it to each other. Yeah. That's, what you just, do. That's what you do. You just pass it to each other and then it's all happy days. Play, play it to a midfielder who's better than you and let them do something. I think it's just so easy to lose that though as mm. well. Like I think it's so... I think we talk so much about, oh, this player has so much confidence, but I think it just shows how quickly you can lose it. Yeah. When you kind of stop getting that rhythm and that flow, how quickly you turn down them decisions because you think, oh, I haven't played for a couple of days. If I play this pass and it's a mistake, then people see it as a mistake and they go, oh, she's not you know, match fit enough. Mm. She's not match ready. The brain's not working. And it's so quick how it just fizzles out a little bit because when you're in a rhythm of playing 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 like I said you kind of get a rhythm of who you're playing with what runs they make okay are they going to be the stretcher in behind am I going to be the ball player that comes to get the ball to feet and then you just quickly lose it so yeah it's it's a really difficult thing to describe confidence in football I think people go all the time about it and it's it's such a it's so up and down all the time where, where do you think you guys would find that from if say if you've lost confidence right and you're you're no matter where it's come from, do you look to your manager? Do you look to your teammates? Do you look to your friends, your family? Where, where do you think you guys would look for like, right, I'm having a bad spell here. I don't know how to get out of it. Who do I chat to? Well, my dad is absolutely savage Does with he? me. Some of the messages, <laughs> some of the messages he sends me and I'm like, oh, brilliant. Thanks, dad. Really? Like, really believe in me there. Yeah, no, he's savage. Not, I don't think he means to be. I think he's just trying to be funny. But obviously, you know, there's some moments when you should pick and choose. Um, what kind of but, stuff would he say, though? Like, honestly, what kind of stuff? Okay, no, I'm going to tell you a message. He'll probably kill me for saying this <laughs> on the podcast. But I, I find it quite funny because, obviously, my situation now at Chelsea, obviously, I'm probably not playing, you know, as frequent as, you know, I previously have done. And he sent me a message the other day, like, oh, are you playing uh, in the game tomorrow or today? I can't remember. And I was like, oh, yeah. And he was like, oh, she must be resting them for Friday then. Uh, I was like, yeah. oh, <laughs> Cheers, yeah. cheers. Classic. <laughs> like, cheers. Yeah. Um, but no, to be honest, I think previously I would say when I was growing up and younger, I always looked for validation and confidence from my managers. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of, and I've been quite lucky in my career with the managers I've played in. They've all thoroughly believed in me and always saw me as, you know, a, a really big key part of their plans and their games. But I think more recently, I would say I, I try and find confidence in myself because I had a really nice chat with a coach that I really, really admire and who I'm really lucky to work with at the moment. And she said to me, you know, you shouldn't have to get confidence from others. Mm. You should be able to work away on how you bring the confidence to yourself and whether that's reminding yourself of what you've done in your career. Because I think for me, you always get caught up in what's happening right now instead of thinking, well, do you know what? Actually, no, three years ago was, you know, showing what I can do. And I try and just remind myself of them moments because I know that they're still there and I know that I can produce them if I'm able to. And, you know, in, in like I said, in a flow of games. So, yeah, I think for me, I try and look at what I have done instead of trying to find that validation because you're not always going to get it. You, you know, the manager can't give... 25 players validation all week to try and make you feel better and to try and give you that kind of spark so it's about trying to find how how you get it from yourself and that's one thing that you know I've, I've worked on a lot how can I get confidence from the training session that I've just had in terms of like you know if, if you're not getting the game time everyone wants to play so of course you're going to be disappointed but for me I'm super competitive so if I win a game in training and I feel like I've done well, then that gives me confidence to then go home and still have the confidence and still grow with it instead yeah. of just going, I'm not playing, everything's bad, I'm not training well. And you just kind of get stuck in a rut. So it's trying to find your little gains, I think. 
I definitely think when when you're in a spell of not playing, you 100% look at training. You look at the little wins that you can, you can get it from, and, and the, exactly, I, I know that feeling 100%. You've, you've come away from training because that's where you get the validation from. I think though, like, is that when you're talking about confidence from yourself, it's de- that's definitely something you learn over your career. Though, like when you're a kid, when you're young, you you definitely look for that from managers much more because you don't have any ground to work on. When you're older and you're you know, late twenties, early thirties, you've got a bit more of to fall back on. You've had the big games, you've had the experience, you've got the sort of work under your belt to be like, right, okay, I, I, I have done that. This is what I'm doing. I should be proud of that. I should take confidence from that. Whereas, you can get the validation from that. Whereas, as a kid, you constantly seek it. I think from from teammates, from staff, from assistant coaches. You know, if your manager is not speaking to you, you're going to your assistant trying to get the validation from them so I think you definitely try and learn it's still hard though because then I think managers look at seniors to be like oh you should know how to handle yourself like you you know I shouldn't have to look after I've got to look after the youngsters and actually like seniors need the conversation sometimes just as much as the young ones and like I always say managing must be the hardest job because they've got to put 25 different hats on and how to communicate and how to um yeah chat to players but I do find that, honestly, the whole Lauren James thing, I do find it fascinating how you can go from different clubs and then all of a sudden under Emma Hayes and absolutely smashing it. Like, what is the difference? Like, I'd, I'd love to know. I'd love to know how that would have gone. Uh, it was loads of, you could say loads of different act, like examples. You could say Kyline Weir bounced from different clubs and then all of a sudden smashed it at Man City. Chloe Kelly as well moved around, all of a sudden smashed it. There's loads of different players that have worked under different different managers and kind of grown and, and dip up. Lauren James is definitely that, that topic of conversation at the minute was in absolute unbelievable form under Emma, one of the most talked about manage, managers in the game. Um, I'd love to know, like, ma- like pick a manager's brain some days and be like, All right, how do I work with this player? How, how, what do I do differently? Do you reckon that's just a personality thing though? Understanding, like, because when you're saying Caroline Weir, Chloe Kelly, Lauren James, them actually understanding them and being comfortable of who they are. Because the three of them, I would say the similar thing with them is that they're all quite shy, like in a way, yeah. quite, quite just to actually stand back and would keep themselves to themselves. But yet you put them on the pitch and it's like this demon comes out. Mm. So understanding themselves and actually having maybe a, a manager that, that kind of gets them as a person. So rather than actually even thinking about the football it's more it's more the person that's the way I kind of look at it with those three that you just named yeah I think with Emma I mean in the Lauren case I think she's taken a lot of time to understand Lauren and to understand what things frustrate her what things get the best out of her and I mean we all know that Lauren is a fantastic talent and she's an unbelievable footballer and she has so much pressure on her all the time. She is one that people talk about all the time, that look to scrutinise all the time. And she does one thing and people are complaining about it. And, you know, she's still young. She's still learning. She's still growing. And one thing I think Emma has handled really well is obviously when Lauren has done something that people call out her character or, you know, she's been in a situation where people have gone, she's so immature or whatever it is that people have said, Emma has stood by her and basically said to her look like obviously I'm not going to say that Emma probably hasn't told her off a few times of course like it's not like she's going to constantly be supporting her she's going to call her out for some things as well but I think Emma has just made Lauren have a safety and know that Emma will have her back as long as Lauren obviously you know provides for the club provides for the team and and does the right thing so for me, I think it's taken time for Lauren and Emma to get to that spot. I don't think it's just magically happened this season where they've all of a sudden, you know, Lauren's been at the club for a few years now. So I think for me, the, the reason why Lauren is now coming into this is because she knows she has the support from Emma. She knows that Emma has her back. And Emma sees her, obviously, as we all see her, as, you know, one of the best players in the country, one of the best players in Europe, probably one of the best players in the world at the moment. And if you've got a player like that, obviously, you know, you, you, you can take them on if they're not doing the work for the team, if they're not doing the defensive role or whatever it is. But Lauren 
is in a place now where she feels comfortable with the way that she's playing and she knows that she handles the manager's back. And as a player, obviously, Beat spoke about her there when a manager is giving you these compliments and they're making you feel good. You feel untouchable. You feel like when you go on the pitch, you can just move around and have the confidence to do what you do. And I think that's what Emma has brought to Lauren and what Lauren has brought to the club. See, this is what I love about the chat between you three. Absolutely. I just, just want to say how things go in a different direction and absolutely from, from you next gen. I just wondered though, Jen, within that, mm. there's a point Fran made about actually when you're a, an older player and, and you said it too, when you're a, you're a senior player about actually being supported too and mm. being given that confidence and how important that is. And that's where your role in your new club becomes so crucial as well, that you're that leader that people can come to, but also that you feel supported in that. Yeah. And it's a good question. Cause I, I, I generally do think that I don't know if this is an unpopular opinion, but like when you are, you're just expected to crack on and you're expected to get on with it when you are older. Like, I don't know if that's a bad thing to say or managers will be like, no, no, it's not the case. No, you're 100% right. Yeah, like you're just kind of, because you've been in the game long and like that amount of time and probably because you do do the right things most of the time, you're just expected to keep going. So when you do have a down day or an off day, it's like, oh, what's, what's up with them? Why are they... And it's like, the expectation no, I, on you is different. Yeah, I, I'd say so. And that that's hard to maintain. Like, because you, you're still human. You still absolutely love the game. It's still difficult not playing, no matter what anyone says, whether you come in. It's almost like a catch-22. If you come in buzzing and you're not playing, it's like, oh, they're, they're okay with not playing. Like they're And it's like, no, no one will ever be okay with not playing. Mm-hmm. You just make a choice every day to turn up to work with a smile on your face and you know, to, to do the right things and to be the right human around the building. Like, and that's not from, I don't think that comes from a manager that comes from a player's choice. Like it, it confidence will come if you do get the nod to, to turn up and play and get a choice, at, a chance at the weekend. But when you're not playing, you know, you might get the odd conversation, but you don't get much of a conversation. And I think as a senior, you're just constantly just expected. And Yanks, yeah, I'm glad you kind of agreed because I didn't know if that was going to, go the other way or, or come across bad but because youngsters are, are coming into their game you know they're trying to carve a career out they're they're trying to impress and do the most and they will be you know devastated if they're not playing but maybe don't necessarily understand they think maybe or don't necessarily understand how to handle their emotions in front of people whereas like mm-hmm. in front of people you know how to do that when you're older because you know how bad how bad it can look um and I'm not throwing any kids under the bus. Like I would have been there as a kid as well, doing the exact same thing. Like because it's difficult, but I do think when you're older that the expectation is higher. You know how to hand yourself a bit better, so it's just kind of expected. You don't really get unless you approach the manager. It's not as more common, I'd say. Yanks, I'm not sure if you had a, a similar experience. Had plenty of experiences, mate. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I just think from. From my experience, I always found, and, and look, managing is an extremely difficult um, position to be in. You've got to put on so many different hats. But I just think for managers, it is a lot easier to manage younger players than it is to manage older players. And that's from my experience. Because an older player, you go, uh, sorry, a younger player, you ask them to do something, uh, and they'll just go and do it because they, some. Some. some okay some but, Ooh, but game's if they're changed. playing <laughs> but on on the pitch you know what you're but they know there's the consequence they know what they're trying to achieve they know they've got time they know they've got uh they can speak to the manager or other coaches or whoever as an older player if something's wrong or something's not quite right they will speak to the manager but the the conversations would be a lot different than manager telling you what to do. It would be a conversation. So therefore, an older player wanting to know, well, why do we do this and why do we do that? And and especially, Mm. I I think as well, it's different in women's football to men, men's football. And I I only say that through coaching boys and girls. So that's my only... When I've coached in primary school, in uh, teams that I've done, coach the team and they've asked the group of boys to do something they've just gone and done it I've asked a group of girls and they've asked me why oh, and I quite like that yeah. and I think some managers actually 
don't like the question why and maybe you're a little mm -hmm. bit what I found, we're a little bit intimidated, frustrated, defensive. afraid, defensive on the question why, why are you trying to, um, you know, maybe destroy or break up this? We're actually, if they got to know the person, the, the question why is so that they don't get it wrong because they're probably a bit of a perfectionist and want to make sure that they get it right to, for the better of the team and always do better. But I've always come across managers that, that don't like that. And I think with older players, that's what you get. So therefore, I could be wrong and everyone can disagree with me. I think it's easier at this moment in time to manage younger players and get them to prescribe to what you're talking about because older players ask quite a lot of questions, some. <laughs> so yeah, the support needs to be better. I've been trying to kick you off the podcast for a while, Rachel. I know, that's mate. what it is, well, but you just keep asking why. <laughs> last week I got my way. I was like, don't let Caroline come on here. Jen can do this job. <laughs> Presenting, Block. Jen's got it. Get her out. <laughs> oh, we, we all know that. There's no doubt about that. You are listening to Three Players and a podcast in the company this week, Fran Kirby, Jen Beatty, and Rachel Yankee. Right next, a small topic, the world. <laughs> Big win for Chelsea in the first leg of the Champions League. Well done, Fran and co. So the quadruple lives on and world domination. Something we've we sort of touched on before, but with Fran here, how do you handle a different day, a different style, a, a different competition? I mean, I, I guess the, the bonus, Fran, is you get to go and play in these amazing stadiums. I remember you talking about, I think it was Juventus, she said you love playing at once before. You get to experience all these different styles and, and different... Every day, as I say, is, is planning for something a bit a bit different. But how do you kind of get your head around all the four competitions at once? To be honest, I think I've done it for quite a few years now. So it just becomes routine, it becomes just a normal schedule. And to be honest, this year is probably the first year that we've had more days off than I can remember in terms of around game. So I'm I'm not complaining at all about that situation. But um, <laughs> I think it's just more that you obviously we're in a club environment where everyone wants to win. And for me, as an older player, now I would say I, I still have that big drive in me. And I still have that, like I said, that competitiveness. And for me, regardless whether I'm playing or not playing, I go to, into training every day thinking, right, how can I make this the hardest possible for the starting 11 or whoever's playing? Because that's the competitiveness in me. That's the drive in me. So for me, it's quite easy to look at all the games and go, oh my God, we're still in this competition. We're still in that competition because it excites me. It gets me excited to go into work knowing that we're fighting for these trophies and we're fighting for, you know, going, you know, one step further in the Champions League. And I mean, it's not always easy. I think obviously for me, this is probably the first season where I haven't really found myself starting as much and maybe playing as many minutes. So it's a new kind of role for me to understand and to go into training and accept that I'm not going to be playing. But I think obviously as the season's gone on, it's been something that I've more and more accepted. Obviously, players getting into a flow, players getting into a rhythm and maybe I haven't quite been able to get that rhythm, whether it's, you know, selection, whether it's been a little niggle here or there or whatever it is. Um, so for me, it's just exciting to be a part of it and to kind of go through the motion. And, you know, eventually, obviously, it will probably get to a point where it'll maybe exhaust me to continue wanting to be that competitive person in a training environment where maybe you're not getting the reward and in terms of getting the nod to go and play because that's what, obviously, everyone wants to do when you're part of a big club or any club you want to play. So for me at the moment, it's just exciting to be a part of. And, yeah, for me, I want to win trophies. So to be involved in all of the competitions still is just something that, you know, I wanted at the beginning of the season and I hope, you know, we continue to to grow into the rest of the season. Jen, Rach, it's something both of you have been through as well, playing in loads of different competitions. But on that, on that point, Jen, of when you're trying to think, right, going into training, want to start in this one, know it's a huge competition. Mm. And then maybe because of the way that the team wants to set up against that, uh, opposition or the way they want to play something differently. We see it with goalkeepers all the time, don't we? They're rotated through different competitions mm -hmm. too. How do you get your head around that, about things changing so quickly, even in the basics of a week? 
Wednesday to Sunday, yeah. different setups, different styles. Yeah, no, it's definitely difficult. I'd say, especially when you're in, right, at the start of the season, when you're in all four competitions or even up to the business end when it comes to March, April and you're still in all four, maybe a trophy under your belt already, it, it is difficult because the thing is when you're on in all four competitions, you don't have the week to week. You don't have the Saturday to Saturday. There's midweek games. So you don't have a full training week. So you're going into games, maybe starting on a Wednesday night because the, the team's rotated and you're playing the Conny Cup or, or you know, a, a different competition and there's rotation. So you don't have a full week of training. You, you're never really in a flow of training. It, it, it is difficult in that sense. You, you know, you've got your starters who are in the flow of maybe playing 90 minutes and then all of a sudden you've not played in a month, but you've got to step up in a Conti Cup game and play 90 minutes. And it it's like... You're never in a flow. That's how I would describe it. You know, we we've we spoke a lot about flow and rhythm and players in form and kind of when when that role's reversed, when you're the one that's stepping in for players being rested and you haven't played in a month, but you still you're you're buzzing to play and the team's rotated and you know, you haven't gelled as a team, it's messy. There's no other way to kind of describe it. It's really difficult. Like a lot of people just expect people to well, us to be robots really and kind of come into a game and just be in a flow and be on fine form and everything to gel straight away when sometimes you know I remember one Con- Conti Cup game where the whole the, I think 10 of us were rotated and it's like okay we had maybe one training session before going into that game and you know it's, it's difficult not to make excuses but like that's hard that's like you talk a lot of teams that, about teams at the start of a season or in pre-season you try watching a pre-season game and it would look like similar because we haven't gelled yet, so it, it is difficult. Like you, and then you're you're talking about different styles and trying get to getting to know opposition. But I think that's what I love the most about playing in all four competitions. You, you played against so many different European teams, teams across England, especially at the start of the year. I loved it because almost the more teams you're playing, the less you knew about them, so you never knew what to expect. And I kind of really enjoyed that because the focus then became on you. You know, I I would I would say I would get, I can say this because I'm not in the league anymore, which is amazing. But like, when you know, right, say if you're up against a Lauren Hemp or a Frank Kirby or a Sam, you know everything about them. So of course you're going to be more nervous about it because you know what they can do. You see it in the clips every week. You analyze them. You've played against them for years. I would be way more nervous than than going into a game you know, in Europe where you have no idea what to expect and you just, right, you focus on us. We don't have that much footage on, on, the, on another team. There's no not been that much hype in the media. There's not been that much ch- chat about an opposition in Europe because we play in England. So the focus is on us. And I used to love that. I used to love going into European games and not knowing what to expect, but we knew how we played and we knew how we wanted to deliver that game. And it was the opportunity to travel and see different countries. And that was, yeah, the class thing about I loved it. I loved the relentlessness of being in all four competitions and come March, April, it was just a grind to then win trophies. I absolutely loved it. I, I de- look, My first season at Arsenal, we weren't in, I think we were in Champions League, but then we lost it the next year because we, we we dipped it, we dipped down the league. But And I really missed Champions League. That was probably the first year I hadn't been in it in a long time. And it was like, I missed the, I missed the atmosphere. I missed the, the European nights. I miss playing against teams or getting to know players in, in, in other countries that you'd never played against and the youngsters coming up. I remember we played Ajax away and we signed Victoria Polova off the back of it because they were unbelievable. They 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 smashed us physically and it was a really, really tough game. But it's it's one of the best things. The the relentlessness of almost not having that full week of training and just having back to back games. Loved it. Train, play, recover, train, play, recover. Yeah, for me that was one of the best things. You want no matter what anyone says, okay, we can talk about the calendar, but no matter what anyone says, you want to be in all four competitions. If you if you're if you want to play in the top teams, in the top leagues, you want to be in them because it's it's what's the most fun about football. Don't think I'm forgetting the fact that you said you were scared by Frank Kirby. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Should we talk uh, about the FA Cup finals? Or? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. No, as in as in her dominating me. That no, wasn't a dig. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah no, yeah. no, yeah. it's all right. It's gonna happen. Oh, yeah. Rachel, for you, were you scared? Of- no. Uh, when you when you play against these these different stars, was it the same for you? Were you like a a student of studying? who was coming up and sort of who you'd be playing against or you just like that, nah, just let me take them all on. 
Yeah, of course. Um, well, the majority of my career was played as a as a semi pro. We trained two nights a week. We didn't have time to look at anybody else other than us. And th and that was also the teams that I played for in terms of in terms of Arsenal and Fulham. The the manager's philosophy was all about what what do we do, and, and it wasn't to really care about the opposition. And, and not, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way because we were never disrespectful to the opposition. But it was about it was about focusing on us. It was about, you know, how can we produce the best and control what we can control? And that's the only way to do that is to work on what we can do. Mm -hmm. um, the only time that we'd go into, into matches and really focus on different players and different teams was internationally. Mm -hmm. And that going from international games to club games and that mentality, I found quite difficult. And also, like Jen said, getting so much information about, like I'd always get information about the right back. Oh, the right back does this and the right back does that. And this right back, they're going to kick you. Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thank you for telling me that. So all these things I just found, they weren't really helpful. Like the, all the right backs left footed. Well, the right back, the worst one was when they'd say the right back's slow and I got outpaced. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, this is never a good thing. <laughs> or the, or the, but, the fullback's the weak link in yeah, the team and yeah. has an absolute worldie. You're like, oh, brilliant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, but, but those things, they're just, they're not helpful. So really, I, I think the mentality of the Arsenal team that I played for and the Fulham one, where it was just focused on you, we talked about us, how we could be strong, what what our traits were and what, like at Fulham, I still remember the patterns of play that we used to do, like, and it's what, gone 20 years or whatever, but I knew when, whoever got the ball, the other person's movement, because it, it was just something about just concentrating on us and what we could control. And like I say, again, it, it wasn't about the, the, the opposition um, and being in every competition the worst thing, and I learned that probably the first year I was at Arsenal and seeing from the other the other players is we we got knocked out at the semi-final at the FA Cup in my first year at Arsenal. And um, basically the whole team went to watch the final. I think it was Millwall. Uh, I can't remember who they were playing, but it was at Millwall's ground. Millwall won it. And literally, that was the worst thing ever. And I think that was just the lesson of saying you get to the final and you go and win it because this is what happens. So I never wanted to watch a, a, an FA Cup final, whether it be on TV or go to the, the ground. You, you kind of, you felt the pain of that. Did Vic make you do that or was that like a team choice? That was, uh, do you know what? I was young. So mm. to, to be quite honest, I, d I don't know, but I just know that we I was told to be there. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, or, or invited to be there. Um, but yeah, going and sitting and watching that match, it was kind of like, it was hard and you just think, and then you get people sort of saying that should be us down there or, you know, oh. we could do that. And, and it's kind of those things that maybe that was the mentality. Maybe that's, maybe it was Vic that made us, I, I don't know, but um, you understood what it, what it meant an FA cup final, what it meant to get to a cup final, what it meant to, you can't get knocked out of the semi-final stage. Cause I don't know about you guys, but I think the semi-final is the worst game. Yeah. It's so it's, it's horrible playing in the semi-final. Um, so you just have to you have to get to the final and if you get to the final then you've got to turn up and you've got to get everybody to turn up and make sure you win it of course all your semi-finals are going to be great this season Fran I'm just going to point out <laughs> yeah. it's all, it's all yeah. can't wait can't wait <laughs> yeah, I'm just building it up for you yeah. uh, what, what have been your and, and I'm not writing your career off yet Fran of course but but what have been some of the, the highlights from just like the many many matches that you've played in all over the world that you've played as well Wow, that is a very broad question with many, many different answers, I think. Um, I mean, obviously, all the trophies. I can't probably tell you all the stadiums that I've won them in, but I mean, just being a part of a team that has been so dominant for many years and has always raised the level, I think, over the last few years and kind of a bit what Yanks spoke about in terms of focusing on ourselves. I remember the 2020-21 season in particular and every day it was just about if we are better, we are going to win because we know our way that we're playing. We know how each other are playing and 
we just had that confidence oozing out of us. I would have to say, obviously, winning FA Cups at Wembley. You, you can't really compare them. That was all I wanted. It was just... <laughs> <laughs> Jen? I don't know. The, the Man City one at home when I scored in the last... Literally, I think you were in that team. Yeah, the last kick of the game is always one that I remember very fondly as well. Because um, I didn't start the game and I, I was a bit younger then. So I was a bit more... Would I say a bit more temper? I had a bit more of a temper that that I wasn't starting. Um, That was when I was younger, you know I mean? I'm not much better now. Um, (laughs) But um, what else is there? Obviously, Champions League final, getting to Champions League final and obviously not being able to lift that trophy, but getting there in the manner that we did, obviously, at the Bayern at home was, was amazing. Winning my first trophy with Chelsea, you know, joining the team halfway through and being able to kind of help the team do that. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's mainly, obviously, I'm I'm super competitive, so I'm always going to say ones where I've won because that's the ones that, you know, I enjoy the most and that I get my satisfaction from. But I also learn a lot about myself when I lose and how I react a bit like what Yank said in terms of going to the game and having to watch it and having to see, you know, other people lifting a trophy. I remember, I want to say last season I was injured and it was a Connie Cup final and Arsenal won. You guys, you guys beat us in the final. I remember just standing on the side and I think I, stood there, I must have stood there for about 15, 20 minutes just watching you guys celebrate and kind of understanding that feeling and taking it in. And when I see other people lift trophies, I just get so jealous. Mm. So I think for me, it's just feeling that still inside and still feeling that kind of competitiveness and having that excitement to have it. And yeah, I think that's why for me, winning the trophies has always been the biggest part of my career and something that I've really obviously enjoyed doing. Everyone loves winning trophies, of course. But I think for me, it's just something that's so pure inside of me. And for me now, I think having experienced all that with Chelsea and having that experience for now, I think I'm at a place where for me, I want to just find happiness in football, regardless in terms of winning. And obviously I will always still have that drive to win. But for me now, it's how can I just enjoy what's going to come next, obviously, because I've been playing for so many years with pressure, been playing for so many years in terms of, oh my God, how's Fran Kirby playing today? How is she coming back from this injury? How is she coming back from this illness? And there's been a lot of spotlight on it. And every time I've kind of played, it's been, oh, well, she's not quite what she used to be. And it's like, okay, guys, like give me a bit of time. So now I think I'm at a point where I just want to enjoy it and, and find that happiness. And I think having them core memories and them amazing memories of winning and you know, talking about the moments that I remember for me now, I've got them amazing memories. So now it's just, you know, enjoying it and, and finding the happiness in the next few years. So I'm I'm excited for that. But obviously the core memories are ones that I will take with me for, for the rest of my life, for sure. Do you know what? Listening to you speak there just reminded me back in, oh gosh, I can't even remember what year, but you played for Reading and I'm sure we played against you. It was that game made my career match. That that, that yeah. was that was the moment that <laughs> as you were talking, yeah. that's what I was thinking. I remember that game, and well, you'll remember it better than me. But like there was, I, I didn't start that game, so I was sitting in the stand, and um, and I remember kind of like it was being a little bit disappointed not to play, but also Luds was Jane Ludlow was the uh, the manager of Reading, yeah. so former teammate wanting her to do well but obviously not to win and then watching you and we're like whoa (laughs) she absolutely smashed it so are those those I don't know memories and feelings that because you were good that day man I scored a pretty good goal that day as well I honestly that game it's very that made my career good Seriously, like if I hadn't have scored probably that kind of goal, I don't know where my career would have gone, to be honest. Um, but no, th- th- that's the kind of feeling that I want again. I want that feeling of, you know, of course, like I said, I always want to win trophies. That's always going to be my main drive. But also just to get to a point where I can train and enjoy it. I can play and enjoy it. And for me, that's when you're going to get the best from me is when I'm playing with a smile on my face and playing with a little bit of freedom and playing with happiness. And I want to get to a point where, You know, I'm playing football and playing with a smile on my face like I was back in Reading, like I was, you know, when I was, you know, having amazing times with Chelsea. And for me to accept kind of the next few years, I think for me, it's it's a massive moment in terms of just enjoyment. And that's definitely going to be, you know, what I want from myself. Thank you, Fran. 
no worries. It can't always be easy to say about, you know, wanting to get that enjoyment back, but it's something that got all of you. That's why you got into football, right? Because you enjoyed just the simplicity of kicking a ball, having that moment, having that goal, having that clearance, whatever it, it might be. And it, it it's kind of, it sounds like it should be something that's simple to get back, but I know it's not always the case. So, so thank you for talking about it. And now you can uh, humiliate Jen with FA Cup finals. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> uh, you are listening to Three Players in a Podcast. Use the hashtag 3PP. Right, one final topic, because the only reason Fran agreed to be on this podcast was if we talked about her love of dogs. That's right, isn't it, Fran? Absolutely. I saw that in the, in the end of the brief and I was like, yes, we're going we're gonna to jump on this. <laughs> <laughs> so is it Cody, your cockapoo? Yes, Cody is my cockapoo and he... It sounds a bit weird, but I was about to say love of my life. Um, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, he he has been through my whole Chelsea journey with me as well. So he's experienced the amazing moments and the lowest moments. So, I mean, he doesn't care. He just gets his food. So he doesn't care about all that. But yeah, no, he's he's been great. <laughs> but that's that's the point, isn't it? You talk about when you unwind, actually, just having I mean, dogs just will give that unconditional love won't they? They'll, they'll, they'll just go out for a walk with you when you need to. They'll, they'll sense when something's not always right. Is 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 that key for you to have something where you can just totally switch off? Yeah, I mean, I've wanted a dog since I can even remember. I remember I used to pester my mum about it all the time. Every time I'd come home from school, I wanted a dog. I wanted a dog. And she said to me, when you move out, you know, you can go and get a dog. Um, and then obviously I moved out. And then I think I got injured at Chelsea and I just made a split decision. Me and Beth England were sat on my sofa and I went, right, I'm going to go and get this dog. Next day we went to go and look at the dog, put a deposit down and took him home, you know, a couple of weeks later. And it was literally just so right. I'm going to do it. Da, 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 da. And then, yeah. And for me, it was just such a, it's a distraction. It's a, it's a way of, you know, if you've come home and you've lost, the dog doesn't know that you've lost a game of football. The dog doesn't know if, you know, these things, there's things wrong in your life. They're just there. And when you've got an injury and you're, you know, I had a, he was a puppy when I had my first injury. So instead of me worrying about my knee, I was like, oh my God, what wall is he chewing now? What's he taking off the floor? What's he doing? So it was just, just another distraction. So yeah, it's, it's definitely been one of the best decisions I've ever made. And it's definitely got me through some really hard times. And when I had my knee surgery last year, came home and lay on the sofa. And the first thing he did was rested his head on my knee. That's and I think I've, I think I've got pictures of him like resting on my knee and you, they just they just kind of know and he also can be an absolute nightmare as well I'm painting him out to be this lovely lovely dog like he he also has his moments where I'm like I want to get rid of you um but I mean it's, in in some moments you're just like ah, oh, like you're just you're just so cute <laughs> I think we pinpointed, didn't we, um, when Viv and Beth got their dog, Jen, we were saying that was that was the moment that we knew recovery was going to be all right in the ACL household. To put a yeah, smile that, on that was face. the shift. That was the shift in mental health, I'd say, in the Arsenal Arsenal team. No, but, yeah. but you, like really similar story. I think Beth was the exact same. Had been had been looking at dogs for. I'd always wanted one. Obviously, she had Rona from back home. Um, and then wanted the exact same kind of dog and literally looked up online and just went and got her. I think she was trying to trying to convince Kim to get her the dog's sister, like in the same litter. Um, and Kim was genuinely tempted for a while, but um, yeah, then went against it. But no, I, th- I think it's, you know, dogs are class, aren't they? They're just so intuitive. And like you said, resting his head on your knee like when you've just had surgery I find stuff like that mad like dogs just know I, like I live next to Steph Catley and she always obviously has Calvin her her dog and like it's so true like me, me and Steph would arrive at the door and if we did a rubbish day at training or even if I had or she had you know she, she's walking in and then she's just got Calvin who's just this bundle of joy like and she's obsessed with that dog and it does just absolutely shift like your headspace you go and I'd imagine it must be like it's like a kid it's like a part of the family isn't it just shifts your men- mental space from worrying about a football game to right okay I've got this dog who's gonna unconditional love and just look like it's class um I'd love to get a dog but I don't know the travel's a bit insane out here I don't know who'd be looking after it yeah but it's one of those ones that I always wondered how do you manage it I know that's such a boring question but like see with the travel and like <laughs> It's difficult. Yeah, so when I first got Cody, there wasn't as many 
games yeah when I first got Cody and I think one year it just it just exploded with how many games we had and um obviously at the beginning I was injured so I wasn't really traveling you know I I was out for quite a long time with my first injury so I wasn't really traveling to games or I wasn't really you know staying overnight so I could look after him but obviously now we're we're really lucky because we have found a couple who live on our way to training and Perfect. they absolutely adore our dogs <laughs> and they have they have their own business and have loads of dogs but it's quite funny now because obviously this month for example I think we've had four or five away games in one month and they've all been overnight stays or they've all been like long days and I'll send them like the dates to say when they've got to come in and then they'll reply saying oh can you look after Cody uh, on these dates because it's like not as many dates for me to have him than it is for them so they kind of make out that I'm looking after their dog like that's how they see <laughs> the dogs now and it's, it's really lovely and like they constantly send pictures so we're, we're really lucky but you know obviously it is is a big responsibility and it is you know quite stressful when you're coming up to maybe a period and someone can't look after the dog and you're trying to squirm around but for example now Cody's up with my aunties and he absolutely loves it up there because they spoil him it's like going on his holidays you know he just gets mm-hmm. spoiled rotten up there so he sees them and he just runs off. He doesn't care about me anymore. He's just right. I'm off with them. See you in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And kind of just gives me time just to, you know, relax, recuperate my thoughts and be able to focus on football or, or do what I'm doing, obviously. So yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky in that I've got quite a lot of people who are happy to look after him. He's not hard work either. You know, he's, he's tiny, he's about 12 kilos. So you can just Aww. boss him around. It sounds like it matures you as a player. Yeah, it's a responsibility, isn't it? It's something yeah. that you have to look after other than yourself. You know, you have to, if the dog's ill, you have to take it to the vets if he needs to go for a walk a certain amount of days. Or, yeah, it's, it gives you something else to think about and to focus on and, yeah, have that side of it, which is really nice. Have we spoken about Winnie on this podcast before? The Arsenal, the Arsenal dog? Group. I don't know, but what a great, great idea. Oh my idea. God, I really want one at Chelsea. Oh, it brings everyone honestly, together, isn't it? Honestly, mate, like, yeah. I, th- I think it was Arteta's idea, obviously, he brought, he brought the dog in and honestly, no matter what day, all of a sudden our, like, secu- the security or whoever would bring in Winnie to, like, I think Winnie was eventually not allowed in the physio rooms, so I don't know if I can say that, <laughs> but when she'd come into the physio room and you've got someone on the bed with an ACL, like, just, and it, it was just, it honestly lit up the whole room and no matter what anyone was speaking about, everyone would just beeline for this dog and like, just, it was class. It was one of the coolest thing I've ever seen a football club do. And it, it was really cool. I don't know if that's a common thing around football clubs now, um, but it was literally a club dog. Is it like the class guinea pig used to take home for the summer? Sometimes that would end badly. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> I'm not talking. Well, the guinea pig went back, whether it was the same one or not. I cannot say. Uh, Fran Kirby, <laughs> Fran Kirby. Uh, let's say goodbye to you before any of us get in trouble. Fran, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast this week. It's been an absolute gorgeous pleasure having you on and hearing some of your stories. And we can't wait to see. Oh, hang on. I've got to think about the Arsenal connection. Maybe lifting not all of the trophies, but some that, that maybe Arsenal aren't involved in if Jen's still thinking with Arsenal and Rachel Arsenal Allegiance. Is that fair? good uh jen bt rachel yankee thank you this podcast was brought to you by cody hair bands i found one right at the end and everything else in between until next time have a lovely week bye for now <laughs>